Jesus has just said not many verses earlier, and you read the, we read the companion passages together in Matthew's gospel. It would be better for someone never to have born or to have a millstone tied around his neck and thrown into the sea than to live long enough to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Keep that in mind. Look at Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. Well, stand with me if you would while I read God's word and we'll think a few minutes about entering the kingdom as a child. The text tells us they were bringing children to him that he might touch them and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is what it is, the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And we want to read this today and let it grip us. Let us increasingly think as kingdom citizens like Jesus thinks about his kingdom. Thank you. Be seated. Just a surface level reading of the Gospels will reveal that Jesus had a special place in his heart for infants and children. This, this uh, passage occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as a matter of fact. We may not know all the reasons. They may not even be immediately obvious to us. Spurgeon suggests that Surely heaven must be densely populated with children because of infant mortality. He lived in a day when, when children uh, wasn't unusual for, for a woman to have uh, 10 or 11 births and, and several of those children would die at birth or, or in infancy. They would die. And of course, we live in the day of the, of the Holocaust of abortion. And Spurgeon was of the opinion that all children who die in infancy go to heaven. and So he said heaven must be peopled as he said, you know, I, I hear that the, that the number in heaven is numberless, and I look around me, and I don't see that many people getting saved. It must be peopled with children and infants. That was his take on it. Whatever it was, children reminded Jesus of heaven. And then if you yourself, though, spend time around infants and little children, you will immediately recognize that there's something about their helplessness and relative innocence that is precious and can melt the hardest heart. I love, uh, I love to take a small, like a child, infant in my arms and just, as they're, as they're, as they're recently out of the womb, and, and just watch the facial expressions as they sleep. And it's just, it's fascinating. It's thrilling. It's gripping. God has made it so. Because he would teach us about his kingdom through child likeness. So in this passage, Jesus, Jesus presses the importance of child likeness as opposed to childishness. There's a difference. As a mark of those who are entering the kingdom of God, there's something very compelling about child likeness, just as there is something very repelling or repulsive about childishness. Jesus would not have approved of the 15th century adage made once again popular by Downton Abbey. If you watch that series, don't. I just sit there while my wife is watching. But I pick up some things every now and then. What they're saying. In a, in a segment called Manners of Downton Abbey. They tell about how in early 20th, early 20th century Edwardsian England, the children were virtually raised by their nanny, and for one hour a day during tea time, they would be brought in to see the parents. And once the, once the boys reached a certain age, they would, they would be shipped off to boarding school, where they would ultimately go to college uh, at Oxford or Cambridge. The girls, when they reached that same age, would be then taught uh, the craft of, of knitting and embroidering uh, and work, work on being a, a polite young lady as she grew up. But the parents had very little to do with the child. And so the adage was that children should be seen and not heard. Jesus would not have approved of that. And 
And I think as we look at this verse for a few minutes, these verses, ask ourselves, how does Jesus see us? Does he see childlikeness in us or childishness in us? And then as followers of the king, do we understand the nature of his kingdom? Three things I want to suggest to you today. He teaches here the danger of following the king and missing the kingdom. Then secondly, look at his indignant response to misplaced zeal. And in the third place, Jesus teaches the importance of childlikeness in kingdom matters. This danger of following the king and missing the kingdom. Not, not many verses earlier, he's warned them. Offenses may come, but woe to those by whom it comes. Do not offend one of these little ones. Much time later, we're told in verse 13, they were bringing children, they being the parents in all likelihood, parents and guardians, were bringing the children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But the master doesn't have time for that. Stop disturbing him. We're on an important mission here. <laughs> There's a danger. These guys were followers. They were, they were the 12. They were handpicked by him. They were following the king. And yet they were missing the essence of the kingdom. Because the kingdom turns everything on its head, you know. We can be first, be last. You want to be the lead dog, be the servant of all. We've not come for the well, we've come for the sick. We've come to touch the hurting. All these things that he had been teaching and modeling. We just need to be careful that we don't unwittingly plow under those things that are precious to Jesus in the name of accomplishing great things for Jesus. And I think it starts with our attitude toward a little one. Someone has said that you can tell a lot by a culture on how it treats its, its youngest and its oldest, the, the, the most vulnerable, the youngest and the oldest. And America is due a sulfuric fire from on high for allowing more than 50 million children to be slaughtered in the womb since Roe v. Wade in 1973. There, that, that's, that, that's just, that's, that's, the, that's the awful holocaust of abortion on our, on our nation. Doesn't stop there. It's how we treat the little ones. Do we esteem them? Do we recognize how precious they are? We're going to, this is, again, family worship time on Sunday evenings, April the 3rd, and, and right now the, the idea is just to bring everyone in with us from the youngest to the oldest, and then uh, as my wife is able to find people who will, who will look after uh, the little ones, uh, then we'll parcel some of those off. But you need to know right now, screaming babies in here does not bother me, will not bother me. I can preach over it. I got the mic. It's a sign of life. It's a sign of a future. Jesus saw that, and we should too. Secondly, Look at Jesus' indignant response to this misplaced zeal. It's a zeal, you know, you can argue their intentions were good. They wanted, didn't want Jesus to be distracted, didn't want Jesus to be bogged down. Didn't, they, he, he was going places and they were following him. And in Mark's gospel, it's very apparent he's moving from place to place. He's on his way to the cross. But the zeal was misplaced. Jesus' response, when Jesus saw it, when he saw what they were doing, he was indignant. It's a, it's a how dare you, in my name, treat those little ones that way. And he said to them, let the, little, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. Whew. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. You know, it's not true that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. There are things, we better believe the right things. We better do the right things. Sincerity doesn't cut it in Jesus' kingdom. Sincerely following him, sincerely on target, sincerely reflecting his glory, his truth, his agenda, that does 
make a difference. Otherwise, you know, there's a lot of things done in the name of Jesus. And I don't want to get distracted, but I've just been amazed and appalled at what so-called evangelicals are doing in this political season. Zeal in and of itself doesn't cut it. He was indignant with what they were suggesting, what they were doing, that they were hindering. And so he uses this occasion to reinforce what he said earlier. Look at number three. Jesus teaches the importance of childlikeness in kingdom matters. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now in Matthew's gospel, he's, he says two things, and I think this one encompasses it. You must, you must have a childlikeness about you. A sense of helplessness. A sense that I'm not bringing anything to the table to this, to this equation, to this discussion. That, that the, the old song, uh, nothing in my hands I bring Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless come to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. A child, an infant. If you as a parent or a grandparent have held one recently, you look and you know immediately there's a helplessness there. They're, they're totally dependent upon someone else to nurture them and nourish them, care for them. I said a while ago, there's a relative innocence about infants. They learn some things from us that are awful. They learn to mistreat others. They learn to hold grudges. They learn, they watch adults pitch fits and they learn to pitch fits. But they come to this world with a fantastic model of helplessness and relative innocence. So he says on the one hand, receive, if you don't receive the kingdom of God like a child, you, if you look back on when you were saved. When you were saved, you didn't say, well, I think it's about time for me to be saved. You know, I've accomplished an awful lot in my life, and I think, I think being saved is another good accomplishment. No. We're going to look at a fellow like that a little later. The rich young ruler. I've accomplished a lot of things. Now I need to know the secret. What's the thing I need to do to have eternal life? No, that's not how you come to Christ. You come to Christ with the spirit of the Beatitudes. That the blessing comes to those who are, who are aware of their sinfulness, aware of, of their non-deserving, aware of their need, aware of grace. Then I think... Matthew covers both of these things. Some say that he's saying, unless you receive the kingdom of God like you would receive a child, that you would not mistreat a child, you would not abuse a child, you wouldn't exploit a child, you would have a sense of caring for the child. And you should have that kind of value for the kingdom. However you take that, I tend to think that he's emphasizing as he holds these infants up. He's saying to his disciples who sincerely but wrongly thought they were protecting Jesus. He's saying to them, you need to become more like this. You know, there's a danger if you hang around Jesus long enough and you watch him confuse and confound the religious leaders, there's a danger that you might think, yep, that's just how we are. We just, we take no prisoners. Jesus will not have that in his followers. We're to be humble. We're to be the shining examples of folks, of sinners who've been saved by grace. Beggars who found bread. And we're not the bakers. We don't own the bakery beggars who found bread, the bread of life, and we are giving that bread of life to others, just sharing the good news humbly. 
Because the one thing that you walk away with when you, when you gaze long enough upon a child is a humility. A humility. And I think that's what Jesus is teaching here when all is said and done. He took them, these infants, in his arms and he blessed them laying his hands. I'd love, I'd love to have heard the blessing. I'd love to have heard it. He took them in his arms and cried out to his father to bless these children. The parents had seen him and heard that he had healed all kinds of diseases. The parents dealt with the reality of a high infant mortality rate. We will bring our child to Jesus so that he can bless the child and perhaps do some, some preventive messianic miracles so that our children, this child will not be the victim of infant mortality. They brought their children to Jesus out of their concern for life. And Jesus would teach them and would teach us that we too, if we're going to be his followers, must be first and foremost concerned about life, the, the, the well-being of those he puts in touch with us, that we encounter in the way. That there's no time to be haughty. There's no time to strut around as if we know something someone else doesn't know. We're saved and left here for a season that we might bless others and be a blessing to others. Speak edification. Speak words seasoned with grace. Preserving a culture that is, that is so vile. And the sad thing is you see some of the, some of the greatest vileness of our culture in the so-called political debate and discussion of the day. We have fallen, dear people. We have fallen greatly. And the answer to our ills is not in any of the candidates running for office. The answer to our ills is Jesus Christ. Living in us and working out through us as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that God is in us to will and do of his good pleasure, that we are the people. We, are, we as someone said, we are the hands, we are the feet, we are the mouth of Jesus to this generation. And whatever they take away from us, Many things must fall subservient to the blessing of having encountered us as we seek to bless them, as we value them. That's what Jesus is showing. The disciples fell into that, to that cultural trap that you don't value a child until the child makes it to adulthood. You don't hang on too hard because you lose a lot of them along the way. And Jesus says, no, this, this life is valuable. The least of these are valuable. And brothers and sisters, we have to cultivate that. If we're going to be kingdom citizens, then we have to maintain in us a childlikeness, not thinking that I've ever, quote, grown up. I've grown beyond that. I've moved beyond that now. No, I, I never will on, on this earth. Are you kingdom citizens? Some of you here today are not. You've never confessed faith in Jesus Christ. You've never submitted to him as your Lord and followed him in believer's baptism by immersion. You're, you're not living in vital union with him and his church, and I would challenge you to take a look at how Jesus values the least of these. And he would show you value. <clears throat> if you would come to him, if you would confess him, he would show you value. He would show you that you're, you're precious in his sight. And he would receive you as a little child if you'll come to him. And that's from someone who is a little child, a child of the king, walked with him for decades now. And by God's grace, I pray I can walk home to glory, humble, grateful, not wanting to be a stumbling block to anyone, but wanting to be a blessing to all we encounter.
So let's leave this place today determined to bless one another and to bless others. Because Jesus says that's what he's looking for in kingdom life and kingdom living is a sweet child likeness. Childishness, by the way, is just having to have your own way and willing, being willing to pitch a fit for it. And that's unbecoming, unbefitting a child of the king. Let's pray together.